Good afternoon, and welcome to Jeff and the Rabbi. You know, the last temple of the Jewish people was destroyed by the Romans about 1950 years ago. Why are people still mourning that tragic loss today? Year after year, there's all the wailing and moaning and people yanking the hair from their beards, and that's just the women. Now, I am sure that this was a wonderful and holy place. It was also the center of all religious life. This is where they did the daily sacrifices and probably hosted the weekly temple softball league. But it was just a building, right? In some American cities, and definitely in Jerusalem today, there is a synagogue on every street corner. What was so significant about this temple? What other people on this rotating orb that we call Earth are still crying over a building that was destroyed over 1900 years ago? Well, according to the rabbi, this actual temple was the connecting point between man and God. So when the temple was destroyed, that close connection that the Jews had to the Almighty was broken as well. Okay, now I'm getting the cataclysmic ramifications of this destruction. On the sucking the scale of 1 to 10, this was probably about a 12.3. That's what I'm thinking. To give you an example from today's world, this would be like Al Gore taking back the code to the internet. You would no longer be connected to anything important. How could you even have any more good ideas if there was no one there to hit like? How would you have any direction in life without Instagram, Pinterest, or Twitter? You would not know how to dress or, or hear the newest weekly reason why Trump must be a racist or a colluding traitor. And even never learn which Kardashian hooked up with which NBA player last week at the bungalow Santa Monica. Life as you know it would be over. How? Now you probably understand the screaming, crying, and beard yanking. Losing your connection to what you worship most is unbearable. So the questions are, one, what do we do about it? Two, when can we get this connection with God? When can this connection with God be restored? Three, is it close to the time when the temple can be rebuilt? And most importantly, four, will Caitlin ever get an NBA player of his own? For these questions and more, we turn, to the, we turn to the source for everything biblical and reality TV related, the rabbi. Wow. You know, I kind of pride myself on like the fewer references that you make to like contemporary culture that I know of, right? the better and healthier I think I am. Yes, yes. Right. So not, not that healthy today. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I recognize too many of them. That wasn't good. But that last okay. one, I had have no idea what you were talking about. Thank God. Caitlin, Caitlin Jenner. Caitlin Jenner? Yeah, yes. He's not, he's like, I don't he, think she, she. Right, what's that to do with basketball? Because uh, the rest of the Kardashians, he's a Kardashian too. He's married to a Kardashian, and they date a lot of NBA players. Got it. So okay. I was wondering, he would get an NBA player as well. That was the, the connection there. Okay, well, I guess that's all our time. That's, we all, I mean, that's, that's all we have. That's, that's it. We'll see you. I coming. hope that explained everything to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a you know there's a baseball league here, the synagogue baseball league in Atlanta. Oh, I did. I saw some emails. There's a synagogue baseball league in Atlanta, and um, one of the synagogues is the temple, They're down on Peach Street. They, it's called here the temple. Yep. Everyone refers to it as the temple, and um, there's there it's very large. They have a lot of people, a lot of players. So they have two teams. They have a, and, you know, they have the first team and the first team and second team. So a few weeks ago, our synagogue was playing the second team and. You know, we we beat him like handily. Wow. So I, you know, told everyone that you know, Congregation Ariel destroyed the Second Temple. Oh, I like that. There you go. Okay, okay. we're done for the night. Yeah. Okay, now we're definitely done. You got That's yours. I got mine. Well, you know, we'll see you next week. Nothing uh, more to talk that's about. It. That's it. Yeah, but here we are coming up um, Sunday. This coming Sunday. Uh, although the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, A-V, Av, the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av is always observed as a day of mourning. Right. This year we're going to observe the tenth day of Av because the ninth day of Av is actually Saturday. That's right. the Shabbos. And we don't mourn and we don't fast on Saturday because it's the Holy Sabbath. So it's pushed off till Sunday. Makes sense. So this year we're actually going to observe the ninth day of Av on the tenth day of Av. But anyway, Makes sense. what happens every year is when the tenth day of Av comes around, we turn the lights down low in the synagogue. People sit down on the floor. We read a book called Lamentations written by Jeremiah lamenting the destruction of the temple. 
and then we say these kinos, which are called, which are elegies, and they're basically tragic poems about the tragedy of the destruction of the temple, and well, we're at it, all kinds of other tragedies that have occurred in Jewish history throughout our long oh, exile. Right. That is what the night of and most importantly, we fast. The whole day, starting at sunset, all the way through uh, when the stars come out the following night. So it's a long one. Long fast. This is gonna be like Saturday Summer. night all the way to Sunday night, yeah. And it's you know very mournful and very uncomfortable because of the fast, and it's usually a hot day because it's summertime and all that stuff. And therefore, the question is often raised, how is it, after all of these years, we're still doing all of that stuff, right? Now, you wouldn't be surprised to know that really only the very orthodox observe this. You, you can imagine that people who are like lesser orthodox don't get so turned on by fasting, yeah, morning, thing, yeah. uh, sitting on the floor, you know, that stuff. I'm still into the beard yanking, but the, uh, the, right. the other thing is not as good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really not um, so popular amongst people who are not in the more orthodox persuasion, but those who are, every year, they wouldn't miss it. It's really, really important. And we actually like get into it. Not that we're so excited about mourning, but we take this as an opportunity to like dig into sadness and tragedy, and we want to know why. And that's our question. Why is it that we're doing this after all of these years? Why do we still go back to this point? Very big problem. Now, the answer, as you started to say, is this is really important. It's an important, important time for us. It's an important time because it tells us that we started with a tragedy. Right. Now, why do you want to start with a tragedy? Most people like to start at a high point. Right. Tragedies are things that like you like to look past. But for us, like we start with this tragedy. So what we really do is, the reason we mourn this temple and the destruction of this temple is we try to get back to the point where we understand what did we have, therefore we understand what we lost, and therefore we understand what it is we're trying to regain. Okay, now that makes sense. You know, they do this in, in marriage counseling. Right. You have the couple sitting in front of you, and uh, he can't stand her, and she can't stand him, and they're totally at odds with each other, and, who is this guy? You know. So what you'll sometimes do, the marriage council will do is, well, let's go back to a time when you were happy with each other, when you were in love with each other. Let's talk about your marriage, or when the, your wedding night, or something like that. Try to find a time when everyone felt good and whole and positive with each other. You get back to that point, and then you see what you had, what could have been, then you can try to track how did it go off the rails and perhaps put it back on the rails right. again. So we go back to this temple. What did we have? That's for starters. What did we have? So what was different when we had the temple than then yeah. after? So the before, too. <clears throat> so the Jewish world, the Torah world, believes and understands the function of the temple, it took its cue from the, what we read about the tabernacle in the desert. From the time that there was a Jewish people, that's starting in the desert, after they came out of Egypt, uh, within a year after they were out of Egypt, you know, God didn't intend for them to spend 40 years in the desert, but after a year it became apparent that they were on a big detour and they weren't gonna make it into Israel. Yeah. So God says, I'm taking you into Israel. I was going to make my place within you, but I see now that you're detoured, so we're going to need to make a temporary place within you. So he built the tabernacle. And he said, when you get to Israel, you're going to build a permanent temple. What's the function of the permanent temple? That there should be a physical spot where there can be a communion between man and God. Now, of course, man can relate to God, and God can touch man anywhere on this planet. Right. Right. But what God does is he sort of concentrates himself into a single spot in this world because that's the way we are. You know, we are very difficult. It's very difficult for us to understand concepts like everywhere, everything, forever, always. True. 
you know, unlimited, very hard. Right. Living in this timeline here is very difficult to do that. Yeah, we, we are timeline people, you know, there's yep. yesterday, there's today, you know, tell me eternity. I mean, what does really that mean? Nah, that I mean, all I know, eternity, I mean, when you go to a funeral, you go, I, uh, not eternity. Right. Right. I know that I end right there. Right. 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 I can't right. get past that. And, you know, I can't be, get past X number of years. And, and you know, I can't be, get past this height. You know, the shelf that's under my reach is under my reach. I live a life that is confined. I live a life of place. I know that when I'm here, I'm here, and I'm not there. In order to get there, I have to take a trip and I have to travel there and travel between here and there. I can't just like, you know, uh, beat me up, Scotty, and right. you know that I'm somewhere else. It, I don't understand these references. You keep yeah. talking about. Sorry, go ahead. Right, that's like, right. it's something like when the dinosaurs were. Yeah, right? that's what that was, okay. So, um, therefore, I live in a world, a physical world, and in order for me to understand God, who's unlimited, all-powerful, eternal, all the things that I'm not, which is really difficult for me to connect to. So God says, I'm going to give you a place. I'm going to give you a place. Within all of your places, you can have a special place because you live in a, you're a place type of person. Right. You're going to go to a place, and when you go to the place, I'll let you experience that sort of unlimited divine. And people used to be able to go there, and not just Jews, anyone, anyone on the whole planet okay. could go there, could pray there, could bring offerings there, and in the part of the offerings is like offer themselves to connect with the divine. And was it a better connection with the divine at that time? It was connection like no one else experienced. Wow. Now, can I tell you what that was? Mm -mm. Because, so you know, I remember my, my father of blessed memory used to go to the grocery store, go to the supermarket, buy tomatoes. He come home, eat the tomato. He says, what is this? They call this a tomato? He grew up as a kid. They had a garden. They ate their tomatoes from the garden. Right. They didn't right. have supermarkets when he was a kid. They grew their tomatoes. He says, those are tomatoes. Those tasted like real tomatoes. This it doesn't taste like a tomato. I eat it. I said, it tastes like a tomato to me. He says, never no, had a real tomato. Eat. Yeah, he said, what do you know? This is no tomato. I never had a tomato. I don't know what I'm even missing. Right? I don't know what I'm missing. I mean, try to describe sight to a blind person. So you can describe and describe and describe, and the blind guy knows that somehow or another that there is a way for people who have this thing called sight, whatever that is, to somehow know, you know, what is over there even though they're not touching it right. and they're not hearing it. I don't know what that is, but I know that, you know. So all I can do is like describe, describe, and describe. But the people who were there, who had the experience, write about being in a different place because they were transported out of their physical, yet still in their physical. I'll give you a few examples. The Talmud says that within the temple, the rules, the physics were suspended. Well, that's interesting. So that lists a whole bunch of things used to happen there. One of them was that everyone would jam in their at the holy Yom Kippur prayer. And at the certain moment when they would utter God's name, everyone would prostrate themselves, spread eagle on the floor. Now, when they were standing and they were packed in like sardines, and then when they came time to prostrate themselves on the floor, everyone had room to go spread That's eagle. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. How'd that happen? Don't know. That's pretty interesting. Don't know. That's because the standard rules when they went in there were suspended. So people saw things and felt things and experienced things. And when you walked away from there, you go like, well, there's a God. I, I experienced it in this world while being here in this world. And when you left, you knew that there was still that place where there was that connection point between man and God. Now, the rest of the year, that helped you relate to God and understand God and feel God in your life. But this was a place where it was really, really palpable. Then the people were sinning. They weren't doing good. They were bad to God. God said, I'm destroying the place. Once he destroys the place, we don't have that connection anymore. That's not there. Well, and now we live in a world like our world. You believe in God. You don't believe in God. You say yes. You say maybe. No. Yeah. You know, like everyone's got their opinion. And even the ones who believe in God, 
you know, I believe in it, I can't really prove it to you, but I believe in it, I feel it, it seems to me. Even the ones who believe in it, really, down deep, it's a struggle. So, you know, this is, what, this is where we're at now. So interesting. So, like, so as soon as the temple is gone, that connection is broken. And for the next 2,000 years, we're just out there on our own. I mean, we're not there on our own, but we don't have that special connection. So there's an interesting thing. It's a really interesting passage in the Talmud. It talks about how God goes into exile with us, meaning he's looking out for us. He's watching us, except he's behind the screen. You know, Wizard of Oz? Oh, yeah. You know, behind the curtain there? Yeah, yeah. So he's really watching the whole thing, but not palpable, not real, not, you know, in the space that we know really that he was uh, once upon a time, but not anymore. Mm. Well, then, on our other question, skipping the Caitlin Jenner question, you know, I mean, well, when... when you get back to some of the other okay, important I'll, ones. I'll just get the other ones that are not as important, but when, then when is this all going to come? Is this where we okay. waiting for the Mashiach for this to happen? Is that the only time? So, that so here's the deal. Here's the deal. This is how it's described. There will be a time when this is going to finish because this is a temporary this is a separation. This is not a divorce, which, by the way, gets into a lot of theology, Christian Jewish theology. Christian theology has the Jews as having divorced. God said, I'm done with you. You bunch of cheating, no good, get out of here. I don't want you. And God doesn't treat them very nicely anymore. And as a matter of fact, if you're a Christian and you don't treat them very nicely, like you do some pogroms or, or maybe some blood libels or something like that, it's understandable because look at the way you treated God. You deserve that. That's what that kid Danny meant in the fourth grade. I, did not, I was wondering why he was treating God. Yes. I didn't know that he already knew all this stuff. Yeah. So they okay. say divorce, yeah. rejected. We say separation. But separation means you get back together. Mm -hmm. right? right? Separation means everyone sort of like goes back into their corners. They stop and appreciate how good it really was, and then they realize maybe I'm going to have to try better again, and we put it back together. When's it supposed to come together? Our tradition is that it concludes by the year 6,000. Well, that's coming up. 5779 this year. Oh, wow, so it is coming up. 5779 this year. So what, how many years is that? That's like 19, no, 20, 19 years there? 200 and oh, 220, 50, 220 right. years is, right. is supposed to be done by then, but it could come any time. Matter of fact, as a matter of fact, by the time we've already gotten into the year 4,000, it could have come any time. But we are hoping and we remain faithful that by the year 6,000 it will happen. And as a matter of fact, of course, we're always looking forward. We're always interpreting everything that happens. This, this is a sign. It's almost here. It's coming. It's going to be next year. It's going to be this year. It's going to be tomorrow. As a matter of fact, wherever you go now, in the right leading up to the day of mourning, the ninth day of Av, you know, Jews are saying, well, this year it won't be because this year we'll be celebrating because it could happen any minute now. And all right. We're eternally optimistic. But if it doesn't come, as a matter of fact, our credo is every day I'm waiting for the Messiah to come. And even though he may tarry or delay, nonetheless, I wait for him every day that he will come. Well, that's pretty so, patient. We're patient people. Well, we're not that patient, but it sounds like we're patient people there. So therefore, one day a year, we devote just to remembering what it was and that it was destroyed and that we're without it. Because if you don't spend a day remembering, like for example, if you're separated, and you know the way you're separated, so you gotta find your own place. Right. And you gotta make your own meals. Right. And you gotta take care of yourself and do everything yourself. After a while, you could forget that you're separated, because now right. you're just single. Right. So it would be like saying, you can be separated, but once every X number of days, you have to spend a day being separated, because you can get so good at being separated that you actually become single. And therefore, we remind ourselves that we are separated right now. There was a temple. We were destroyed. We used to be together. That's what the day is all about. And that's why it's really important to spend one day doing that because it brings us back in touch with who we are and where we are. Once we know that, then we can look forward to repairing and coming back together again in the bright future. The Talmud has a very oppression statement. It says, 
those that mourn over the destruction of the temple will ultimately rejoice in its rebuilding. Those that don't will not. Now what does it mean, those that don't will not? If they don't, so then, you know, it's like saying, someone asks you, are you separated? Well, no, I'm single. But I thought you were only separated, you never got divorced. Oh yeah, I forgot, I never got divorced. Oh yeah, but I just put my life together, now I'm single, I take care of myself, I do all my, I'll do everything on myself, you know, I apply for my own insurance policy and my own, I, I check single on the box when it says, right. you know, whatever the form says, and so on and so forth, I'm single. And I forget that I'm even separated. Well, you're not going to enjoy getting back together like that. It's never going to happen. So that's the whole purpose of it, and like the law, at least, is you know to remind ourselves that we are still not reconnected the right. way we were with God, and that that connection is possible because you know people get single. Yeah, I'm pretty happy. So I'm pretty happy. I'm single. I get life for myself. I get everything I want. I watch whatever I want, when I want, right. I do what I want, I get to bed when I want, I get up when I want, everything, I love it. Doesn't sound that bad. Only the Doesn't things I want are in the fridge, and I eat wherever I want, and I take vacations wherever I want. It's wonderful. So what do you do? Yeah, I'm like, take out the photo album. Yeah, remember, like when you went there with that other person, that was nice, wasn't it? Wasn't it right. nice there? Wasn't it nice to have someone at home when you came home, and so on and so forth, yeah. you know? And the good, the good times, there may have been bad times, but there were good times. And you have to remember those and reconnect to them so that you know that you're headed towards reconnection. And therefore you spend your time right now thinking about, instead of spending all my time thinking about how to make life good for myself when I'm single, you spend time thinking about how to fix up my life so I can get back together again. Very interesting. That makes sense, that makes sense, I, I guess. So we're, our goal, is to reconnect, not to stay separated. Absolutely. Our goal is to reconnect, mm -hmm. and when we do, it'll be in a in a way that we don't remember because we haven't experienced it. But it'll be in, in that we personally have experienced, and it'll be in a way that uh, is beneficial to all. You know, my son, the um, the night before he got married, or days, few days before, he's doing the whole cold feet thing, and he's mm -hmm. all like, you know, da 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 da. And but she is this, and I'm that, and da, 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 da. I and I tried to say to him, you know, he's talking about how he will feel about her when they're married, and I said like, you don't know how you're gonna feel about her when you're married. You gotta get married to know how you feel right. about her when you're married. That's you know, true. and I can't describe it to you. I am sorry, I just cannot describe it to you. No one can describe it to you. Figure that. You, you just got to do it. Once you do it, you'll know it. So it's kind of a pity because we have been so long separated that we really don't know exactly what it was all about. That's interesting. So we look back at the glorious building and we read the descriptions go, wow, it must have been phenomenal. I really don't know it, but it must have been really good. So when we get there, we get there. But yeah. we gotta be waiting. We can't be Right. You gotta at least gotta know that it was there. Other gods. Right. You at least gotta know that it was there so that you can get back to there. Which of course changes your entire orientation. Because now you're going somewhere. Like at least you're trying to get back to a certain goal. You know what that goal is. Otherwise, what am I doing? How long is this gonna last? And the next thing you know is maybe I'll just get off because this doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Right. Makes sense. All right, well, that makes sense. That explains a lot. Not the last part of it, the whole Kardashian thing, but I'll have to deal with that. We'll have to deal with that in the yeah, next episode. Have to, the next I guess. episode, yeah. Have to, yeah, I think, I think that maybe you'll have to take we'll over have, for that we'll one. Have to do that. I've got a lot of learning to do here. You've you really got a lot of studying. Yeah. More than the Talmud, I think. Yeah. All right, makes a lot of sense. All right, well, let's reconnect. And we'll reconnect with you next week. Yeah. And Jeff and Rabbi. May the temple be May rebuilt the temple by the We're coming live from Jerusalem. It might be a special episode. See you then.